Good morning, my name is Duffy Robbins. Good to see you. You're looking good. Uh, if you're visiting here today, we are delighted to have you as a part of our community. It's a delight. Last week, um, here at Faith Bridge, I began a little kind of a mini-series, a two-week mini-series. I'm calling Storms and Thorns and the Goodness of God. And it's sort of a brief study of how the Apostle Paul dealt with the hard stuff and the challenges in his life and how that might help us to better understand uh, the way God leads us uh, through uh, the difficult stuff that we face every day. And, and last week we talked about Paul's uh, experience of being shipwrecked uh, in a, a storm off the coast of North Africa and, uh, and how God sometimes surprises us by using uh, even the storms in our lives to actually uh, bring about his purposes and, and then how that assurance made it possible for Paul, even in the height of the storm, uh, Acts chapter 27, verse 25, uh, to say, take heart, take heart. I have faith in God. Now this week, we're going to turn our attention from the storms uh, to the thorns, uh, where we're going to shift our attention from what the book of Acts uh, described as a violent storm at sea and focus instead on what the apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 describes as a thorn in the flesh a thorn in the flesh. It might help you uh, when, when you uh, kind of talk about these storms to think of the kind of the big crisis events uh, that blow in hard across the map uh, of our lives, right? So this would be like a loss of a job, a bankruptcy, uh, some accident that, that puts you out of commission, a hurricane, uh, you know, a, a problem, pregnancy, a divorce, a bad breakup. These are, the, they're kind of violent. They're kind of, they're obvious. Everybody sees them. Uh, but they're usually seasonal. Uh, and they come and they go. They cause a lot of damage, but, uh, but they're short-term. They're short-term. Uh, over time, the skies uh, start to become clear again. Thorns, on the other hand, are like those kind of nagging stresses, chronic pains, uh, irritations that get under your skin and, and, and cause ongoing pain. They, they may not do a lot of damage on the outside. Some folks may not even know uh, of your suffering, but they can become embedded uh, in, in your body and your heart and your soul for years and left untreated, uh, they can cause infection and decay on the inside. So uh, if you have a Bible, I want you to turn with me this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, no doubt uh, you noticed, as did I, these people wandering aimlessly down the aisles. Uh, they, uh, th- they were actually looking for people to whom they might uh, pass a Bible. So if you don't have a Bible, if you'll just raise your hand. Uh, we've tried to canvas this already, but uh, if you didn't get one and you need one, put your hand up. Uh, perhaps you thought it would be awkward just to raise it without being told anything. So, so uh, yeah, it, we want to make sure you get a Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, just keep this one. We'll just take it as a gift as a gift from us. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we will begin reading in verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Tricky, tricky to find it. It's a little tiny book in the New Testament. Uh, my, my deal is always go to 1 Corinthians and take a right. So, so uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses, though, If I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. Now, let's look closely here, verse 7. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, 
I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. There's a, there's a, a book that's written by a buddy of mine named Doug Fields. The book is called Would You Rather? And essentially, all the book is is kind of a resource for youth workers uh, to kind of get discussions started in a small group. Uh, so it's kind of a, just kind of an icebreaker type question. And essentially, the book is nothing but uh, a whole list of questions, all of which begin with the words, would you rather? Uh, so, so questions like, uh, would you rather be a doctor or a lawyer? Uh, would you rather put together a 200,000 piece jigsaw puzzle or read the dictionary from cover to cover? Uh, would you rather be rich or famous? Uh, oh, oh, and I love this one. Would you rather have terrible acne or be bald? <laughs> You're laughing, but look at this complexion. Uh, yeah. Uh, would you rather have blistered lips or paper cuts on each finger? Uh, would you rather excessive nose hair or excessive ear hair? Some or all of the above. Uh, would you rather uh, give, oh, this is a tough one. Would you rather give up Facebook or give up Netflix? Would you rather give up, uh, let's just put this one to a vote, okay? You have to choose one or the other. Would you, how many would give up Facebook? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, that's deeply troubling. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, really a room full of uh, remarkably unfriendly people. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Faith Bridge, visitors. Uh, yeah, I hope you like movies. Uh, okay, uh, how many are going to give up Netflix? Yeah. Let's just stop and pray right now. <laughs> Spirit of carnality and video addiction. Uh, okay, but would you rather dive into a pool of acid or swim in a pond full of blood-sucking leeches? You know, it's fun. If you're doing a small group of middle school guys, they'll go, can we do both? <laughs> right there. Uh, or how about this one? Would you rather look stupid or be stupid? <laughs> Would you rather faint during your wedding ceremony and recover an hour later or throw up during your ceremony and continue right away? <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of a fun way to kind of get discussion started. I'm actually going to, um, I'm going to actually throw out a question for you guys so we can sort of jumpstart our time in the Word this morning. It's not in Doug's book, but I think it's, it's kind of an interesting question to consider. How about this? Would you rather, would you rather suffer short term through a, a, a big violent storm or live longer term with an ongoing irritating thorn? Would you rather suffer long-term through a big violent storm or live longer-term with an ongoing uh, irritating storm? Now, you don't have to answer that question. I realize some of you have actually lived it. Uh, but what I want us to observe this morning is this. When you line up side by side, Acts chapter 27, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you realize the Apostle Paul did not get to choose. He faced both. He faced big storms and irritating thorns. And, and yet, and here's what's kind of stunning. In the midst of both the storms and the thorns, we can still hear loud and clear Paul's testimony from Acts chapter 27, 25. Take heart. Take heart. I have faith in God. And so what we're going to do this morning, it, it, for the second week in a row, is sort of wrestle with this question. How is it that Paul with such confidence and, and contentment, uh, can endure and embrace life in the midst of hard times. Last week with the storms, this week with the thorns. And of course, this isn't just a theoretical question, as, as Pastor Ken reminded us. This is, this is a question that many of us confront on a daily basis. Maybe, maybe you are actually struggling with some sort of physical ailment, a physical thorn, and, and, and there's no sign of improvement. Uh, I, I actually read this week that one out of every 10 Americans suffers with chronic pain. One out of every 10 Americans. Maybe for some of us here this morning, it's a marriage. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a marriage situation that started out as this garden of delight, but has now just kind of become this, this, this desert uh, uh, where there's a lack of communication, a lack of life and, and companionship. 
Or, or maybe, maybe for some of us here, it's the marriage you don't have, but you deeply desire. And, and, and you live daily with this kind of nagging uh, loneliness. Maybe for some of us here, it's an addiction this morning. Uh, you, you, uh, you started out, this was a remedy to your pain, but now the remedy itself has become a pain in your life. Maybe it's a desire for pornography uh, that, that, that has just left you with this ugly hunger that, that makes you empty the more you consume it. Uh, or, or, or maybe just this sense with the beginning of school that you know, I'm, I'm never going to be good in school. I'm going to work as hard as I can and I'll never be able to make decent grades or I'll never be able to, to, to lose that 20 pounds I want to lose or I'll never be able to pay off my credit card debt. All of us know these nagging pains, these thorns that, that kind of leave a pain in our life. And the question is, how did Paul do it? How did he manage to live with heart and contentment even with the daily pain of the thorns? Well, we're going to try to um, answer this question this morning by considering three key realities from Paul's life. Three key realities from Paul's life. First of all, the problem. Secondly, the process. And third, the promise. Problem, process, promise. So let's take a look, first of all, at the problem. Look back at the text, verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Paul writes, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. So Paul is, 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 is totally transparent about his problem. He describes uh, being harassed by a thorn in the flesh, a thorn in the flesh. What does that actually mean? Uh, to answer that question, we need to back up just a bit, get a little background. Um, we read verses 1 to 6, and perhaps you noticed as we read through those verses that Paul has this kind of strange uh, sidebar where he's talking about boasting and, and kind of being caught up into a, a third heaven and a paradise. And so, so, so what's that about? Um, in a nutshell, Paul's uh, situation in Corinth was, was, was sort of awkward because he had these opponents who, who championed other rabbis and other uh, teachers, and they pretty strongly suggested that Paul simply didn't cut it as, as a teacher because Frankly, in comparison to the other teachers, he, he wasn't a particularly great orator. Uh, there's some hint that he wasn't that easy to look at. And, 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 and then these other teachers also claim to have been given these powerful uh, mystical visions and, 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 and sort of revelations that kind of gave them uh, a leg up, an inside track on, on spirituality. And Paul doesn't want to get in a bragging a battle with these guys. He thinks that's stupid. He, 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 he thinks that, that, that that's putting the focus on the wrong place. But he says this, look, if you want to play that game, if you want to play that game, and that, that's kind of what it takes to validate my ministry with you guys, then listen to this. And, and you can just tell he's totally kind of weirded out by this kind of one-upsmanship trash talk because he, he doesn't even refer to himself in the first person. You'll notice, for example, in verse 2, he says, I know a man in Christ. That's Paul. So he, he's talking about himself. But he goes on to say, look, 14 years ago, I didn't just have a vision of God. I had a visit with God in heaven, which is very likely what he means when he talks about being caught up into a third heaven or caught up into paradise. He says, I don't know how it happened, and I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail about what happened because that's not really where I want the focus to be. But hear this. When it comes to apostolic credentials, and, and again, clearly, it just feels strange for Paul to even be talking like this. He says, I have better credentials than any of you guys. And then just before he, he drops the mic, he says, however, if the focus is going to be on my self, then it's going to be on my weaknesses because that puts the focus back on the power of Christ where it belongs. And that's what actually leads Paul to talk very openly and candidly uh, in verse 7 about this thorn in the flesh. To keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming 
conceded. And I think, I think all of us can appreciate that, that if you had some sort of mysterious, you know, sort of uh, visit to paradise, to third heaven, uh, to hear directly from God, it would possibly uh, tempt you to get a little bit cocky, right? You, you probably would, you know, be wearing your t-shirt with the, you know, paradise logo and it's just third heaven. And, uh, and so, you know, you know, sort of like people who, uh, you know, sort of like people who, who, who have t-shirts that, that, you know, have hard rock cafe Copenhagen. It's like, uh, you know, you want, you want these other teachers in Corinth to kind of know your cred. Paul understood this was a temptation to become conceited. In fact, he mentions this explicit temptation twice in this one verse. But if Paul knew he was susceptible to this kind of temptation, then the Lord for sure knew this. And so for his own spiritual welfare, Paul says, he was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to keep him from becoming conceited. But what does that phrase mean, a thorn in the flesh. And as you might imagine, there's a lot, a lot of different discussion. Uh, because of the words in the flesh, some people have assumed it probably refers to some kind of physical uh, disability. And there are a few passages of scripture that, that give credence to this idea. Uh, in particular, Galatians chapter 4, uh, verses 13 to 14, where Paul actually talks about a bodily ailment that, that literally impaired his, his ministry. And then depending on which commentator you believe or which one you read, uh, the disability is either a pain in the ear or pain in the head or a pain in the eye or some sort of malarial fever. Uh, some even think it might have been epilepsy. Uh, some uh, even think maybe it was some type of, of sun blindness. We just don't know. We just don't know for sure. And then there are other sources uh, that have latched onto that phrase, messenger of Satan. And, and suggested that, well, maybe Paul's thorn was just the constant opposition and treachery he faced from these, these false teachers. That they were like messengers from Satan. In other words, Paul's thorn in the flesh are these people who are essentially a pain in the neck. So, so that, that's another possibility. Others, uh, looking at that very same phrase, messenger of Satan, wonder if maybe, maybe it points to some besetting sin that, that Paul just just struggled with, like he didn't give in to it, but it never left him, he couldn't shake it. Uh, uh, so it was just kind of this ongoing nagging temptation that haunted him and, and taunted him. And, and I'm sure a, a number of us in this room know precisely what that, that feels like. And then finally, some people, some very rude people, and this is not funny, have wondered if the phrase, I have a thorn in the flesh is proof that Paul was married. Uh, I, like I said, <laughs> that is not funny. Uh, the truth is, we don't know. We don't know. And you know what? I don't think God wants us to know. I don't think God wants us to know because if we knew Paul's thorn was this or Paul's thorn was that, we would make a special case of him. We'd be tempted, right? In our normal human way. So, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if that was my thorn in the flesh or if that was my problem, well, I'd be fine. I'd be, I'd be okay with that. Like we tend to see God's promises as being good, you know, for the other guy, but maybe not sufficient for me. Our situation is different. That's why God is so wise, not only in his revelations, but in his reservations. See, he wants us to understand that he's on a kind of a blank check basis with us. Whatever is our problem this morning, his grace is sufficient. It's not like some insurance policy where you, you know, start to read down the list and go, oh, pff, great. You know, my, my thorn, you know, my pain is not covered. We, we, we really can't know for sure what is Paul's thorn in the flesh. But here's what I want to make sure that we can all agree on. And some of us know this only too well, is that thorns are real. Thorns hurt. And they're a problem. So, so this, is, this is a problem that Paul had to confront. But what Paul began to discover about this thorn problem is that that thorn that made him weak could also, by God's grace, become a gift that made him strong. 
It could be something that made him. He didn't feel like it, but God was in the process of doing a deeper work in Paul. Uh, let, let's talk about that process. Verse 8. Verse 8. Paul writes, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. One of the fundamental principles of spiritual growth is what I like to call the morning sickness principle. The morning sickness principle. Um, some of you may remember several years ago, I told you about, uh, about five years into um, our marriage, uh, Maggie contracted pregnancy. And, uh, and, and, uh, and the way she announced this to me, she didn't do anything cutesy, right? It wasn't like, you know, she put booties on my place mat or, you know, pampers on my pillow. Uh, the way I found out this great news was I woke up one morning to the sound of her vomiting. And that's a little bit out of her normal routine. And so, and, and, and so being a nurturing husband, um, you know, I, I went into the bathroom and said, I'm trying to sleep. You know, I go in there and, uh, but sure enough, there she is on all fours in front of the toilet. As soon as I walk in, I don't even get a chance to speak. She looks up at me with this look of splendor on her face, you know, as, as if she's seen, you know, New Testament scrolls floating, uh, you know, and she looks up at me and she says, we're pregnant. And I wasn't sure how I'm supposed to respond to that. Like, right? you see your wife barfing her brains out, you're not going to go, this is beautiful, you know? And, and um, I sure wasn't going to kiss her. And, 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 and yet, what she was saying was very important. She was saying, look, Duffy, I get it. I know what you think you see right now. But don't be fooled. Something amazing is unfolding right before our very eyes. It may not look like it. But the process doesn't always look like progress. And, and, and I just... I just remember how that kept playing in my mind uh, over those nine months of gestation and pregnancy. And then finally, finally, uh, the, the big night, you know, uh, she, she says, okay, Duffy, it's time. Uh, we need to go to the hospital. I was a youth pastor in Rhode Island. So we go into Women's and Infants Hospital, downtown Providence. Uh, we, we go into the room and we're going through our exercises and, and uh, everything's going pretty well. I had to get two shots, but, but uh, I think the second was vodka, just kidding. But, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, we're doing all right. And, and then they go, okay, Mrs. Robbins, you're ready to go into the labor suite. And I go, oh, the labor suite, you know, we've been upgraded. Like that, that sounds kind of good, right? We labor sweet, you know, you know, oh, cool. You know, maybe, maybe like I'm imagine nice carpet and you know, quiet music and maybe, you know, maybe a TV I can watch while she finishes up. And, and it just sounds, uh, it just sounds delightful. Uh, well, the labor suite at Women's and Infants Hospital was in fact a, a wide hallway uh, in which women were lined up. Uh, on gurneys, uh, each of which were separated by canvas curtains. And I don't know if the hospital was aware of this or not, but these curtains were not actually soundproof. And, and, and so we were hearing just gruesome sounds. Uh, uh, just, frankly, uh, just blood curdling shrieks and, and screams and, and women saying unkind things about their partner. And, uh, and, uh, and I remember thinking, man, I don't know what they're giving birth to over there, but it sounds like a geometric object. And, 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 uh, and, I, just, and I remember thinking to myself, man, if you just walked in here, like you just dropped in from Mars and you landed in the labor suite, you just go, oh my gosh, this is awful. This is ugly. This is terrible. And somebody go, well, actually, no. This is the sound of new life coming to be. You see, men and women, there are some of us here this morning who are in the labor suite. And there is pushing and there is pain. And it's kind of ugly. And it's not very beautiful. I want us to look at Paul's life here because what we see here is the process that does not look like progress, but is the process of new life coming to be. It is Jesus restoring us into who we were created to be. Paul, Paul is right in the heart of that process. He understands 
But look at verses eight and nine. God is at work in his life, but it sure as heck doesn't look like progress. What does he do? What does he do? Well, right off the bat, first and foremost, Paul prays. Paul prays. He doesn't complain about it. He doesn't pout. He doesn't, he doesn't whine. He, he prays, which suggests a posture of faith, doesn't it? A faith and trust, a sort of a willingness to say, okay, I'm going to just, I'm going to give this thing. I'm going to give this thing into the Lord's hands. And that is always where the healing process begins, whether it looks like it or not. So, so it's not, Lord, if you heal me, I'll know you love me. It's, Lord, because I know you love me, I'm going to plead earnestly for you to heal me. I think one of the hardest parts about the process of living with a thorn, at least for a lot of us, is the why question. But why, you know, why is this happening, Lord? Like, why don't you just make this better? And, and it's really important for us to understand this morning that if you are feeling today the pain of a thorn, and many of us are, God is not offended by your questions. God is not offended by your pleading with him. In fact, in James chapter one, um, in verse two, James writes these words. Count it all a joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, when you, when you feel the pinch, the sting of those thorns, count it a joy. And here comes the process, verse three. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And now watch this, verse five. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it'll be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The scripture tells us three times, three times Paul pleaded with the Lord about this thorn, which frankly is, is more likely Paul saying, I prayed again and again and again about this matter. Not, not just literally that he prayed three times. And Paul tells us he did not get the healing he prayed for. What he got instead was the assurance that although it didn't look like it, and it definitely didn't feel like it, that God was doing a profound work in his life. Look at verse nine. My power is made perfect in weakness. So, so God was saying to Paul, in essence, look, it may feel like you're being broken, but in fact, you're being made whole. You're being made strong. I realize this might look ugly. This might look grim. This might look gruesome, but don't be fooled. I am making you into a new creature. You're being, you're being weaned away from a dependence on your own pseudo strength so that you can know the power of spiritual maturity that comes only from my power in you. So trust me. You gotta, you gotta trust me, even though the process doesn't always look like progress. In the New Testament, this, this process um, is known as crucifying the self, crucifying the self. It is slowly but surely killing off the parasites and the viruses of pride and self-sufficiency that eat away at our soul. And it almost always comes through suffering. That's what Jesus was talking about in Luke chapter nine, verse 23, when he said, look, if anybody's gonna come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. But I also want you to notice the very next sentence, the very next verse, verse 24, Luke chapter nine, Jesus says, look, this is a death that leads to life. He says, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself. In fact, it's significant that the word Paul uses here in verse seven for thorn is really a word more accurately translated spike or, or stake or, or nail. In other words, the Greek word refers to something uh, sharp like a stake you'd use to impale something or like a nail that you might put in the hand 
of a crucified person. You see, Paul seemed to understand that, that part of the reason he was given this thorn was for his own spiritual well-being. In verse 9, he says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that, to the end that, the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul understood you cannot be resurrected if you're not willing to be crucified. That's how we get life. Now, I get it. It's totally understandable. If you're sitting here this morning, you're maybe wondering, well, Duffy, like, I don't want to be rude, uh, uh, but isn't there an easier way to do this? You know, I mean, why can't, why can't it be like a plan from your cable company, you know, where, where you don't have to go with the full extreme package? You don't need all 5,000 channels and a live feed from Kim Kardashian's family room. You know, uh, isn't there kind of a reduced thing? Can't I just kind of pick the channels uh, I want? Like, like, I, I, like I had in mind stuff like, you know, maybe praying a little longer, you know, maybe, maybe reading my Bible a little more, maybe, you know, watch a little of Dr. Phil and, and, and cr- listen to Christian radio and, and, and fast between meals and, 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 and work with teenagers. And, and, uh, and, 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 you know, because I'm not really, I'm not really, you know, see, Lord, I'm not really interested in that crucifixion package. I was thinking more along the lines of self-improvement. You're talking self-impalement. <laughs> not too interested in that. Brothers and sisters, what Paul discovered and what a lot of us in this room are learning is that it takes a deeper cut for Christ to do the kind of surgery that turns weakness to strength. It takes a thorn. It takes a stake. And it's a process that does not usually feel much like progress. And that's why it's so important that we understand this process comes to us with an amazing promise. An amazing promise. Look again at verse 9. Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. After Paul had prayed again and again and again about this matter, he became convinced God's answer to him was essentially, no, 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 I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to subtract your thorn. But in the shadow of that no, Paul could see the blazing light of God's yes. No, no, I, I will not subtract your thorn. But here's a clear and certain promise. I am going to add my grace. Because you see, and this is so important for us to understand this morning, men and women, at the heart of God's no is always a yes. It's always a yes. The Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And the word sufficient there, it's interesting. It's from the very same Greek verb that elsewhere is translated satisfy or, or, or to ward off or even to defend. In a sense, the Lord is saying, my grace will satisfy you. My grace will defend you. It's not unlike what we read in that Psalm 59. God is saying, I will be to you a fortress and a refuge in the day of your distress. That's an amazing promise. But listen to this. As you look at the passage more carefully, you also begin to observe that the actual tense of the Greek verb, my grace is sufficient, is, 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 a, is a tense that, that points to something that, that happened in the past, but it's not just in the past. It is an ongoing action. So God said this, but he continues to this day into the presence to offer us his grace. In other words, Uh, Paul prays over and over and over uh, for Jesus to remove his thorn and over and over and over Jesus said to him, Jesus says to him, and Jesus will continue to say to him, my grace is sufficient. And what's amazing about that, men and women, is it reminds us there's no sell-by date on the grace of God. 
There's, there's no sell by date on the promises of God. If you are here this morning and you're impaled by some physical affliction that, that shows no sign of healing, and if you're stuck in some addictive pattern that, that's just draining your strength, if you're stabbed by, by pains of resentment or grief or jealousy or, or failure, don't give up. Don't, don't lose hope. Don't give in to despair because you can cling this morning to this promise. His grace is and will be sufficient. Barbara Brown Taylor, in her book, Learning to Walk in the Dark, uh, talks about an incident that happened a few years ago when she and her husband were uh, exploring the dunes on Colum- uh, Cumberland Island uh, down on the coast of southern Georgia. They were walking down the beach one afternoon and they came upon this huge loggerhead turtle that was just marooned there in the sand. Now, this isn't uh, altogether unusual on the southern coastal shoreline. Some of you know this. These turtles come ashore at night uh, to lay their eggs. And when they finish the job, uh, they instinctively look around for the brightest horizon to lead them back to the sea. Usually that's the stars uh, reflecting off uh, the surface of the ocean. But sometimes, sometimes the lights from beachfront cottages confuse them. And, and so rather than actually crawl for the ocean, they actually crawl the wrong direction away from the water and up higher into the sand. When that happens, when the tide goes out, uh, their flippers get buried in the sand, they get stuck and marooned and, 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 and sort of bake in the hot sand of the next morning. This turtle was still alive, but only barely. Her shell uh, was almost too hot to touch, and they knew she would uh, soon be cooked in the hot sand of the beach unless she could get back into the water. So uh, Barbara Brown Taylor uh, tried to kind of uh, help the turtle by burying her in cooler sand. It was deeper down. Meanwhile, her husband ran to the nearest ranger station to try to get some help. And that's where Taylor picks up the story. An hour later, the turtle was on her back with tire chains around her front legs, being dragged behind a park service jeep back toward the ocean. The poor turtle's mouth was filled with sand and her head was so bent, I feared her neck would break. When they got to the edge of the water, we undid the chains, gently flipped the turtle right side up and then watched as she lay motionless in the surf. But then after a few minutes, the cool ocean water began to revive her and very soon the waves lifted her up. She pushed off with her back legs and swam back into the surf. That's when Taylor makes this observation. Watching her swim slowly away after her nightmare ride through the dunes, I noted that it is sometimes hard to tell whether you're being killed or saved by the hands that turn your life upside down. I know for some of you this morning, men and women, that is precisely what you are feeling. You're, you're, you're like a dazed turtle being dragged through hot sand. And, and thanks to Paul's honest testimony in 2 Corinthians 12, you can know this morning, you are not, you are not alone. Maybe it feels like, you know, you, you've got sand in your mouth that you're being pulled by unknown forces to God knows where. And frankly, you're not sure whether you're being killed or being saved. What I hope you can know this morning, what I hope you've been reminded of this morning from these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is a word of authentic hope. That to some extent, you are being killed. You are being killed. You're being crucified, thorn by thorn by thorn. But it's happening so that we can be saved so that we can know the power and the fullness of the life for which we were created. I'm not gonna try to cheapen your pain this morning with a bunch of easy answers, some kind of you know little snappy slogan, no quick fix. What I am gonna do is simply affirm the clear promise of God's word, which is the promise of life-giving, ocean-wide, ocean-deep grace of a loving God. Paul put it this way, Galatians chapter two. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh. 
I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, this, this feels like the kind of message this morning that invites us to make some kind of response. Normally at this point, you know, I would, I would pray and leave the stage and, and one of our worship leaders would, would invite us to sing and to continue our worship together and then we'd leave. I don't want to waste this morning an opportunity for you to respond to this God, to his severe mercy and sufficient grace. And so this is what we're going to do um, as these folks come out to lead us in worship this morning. We're going to just make this area down front here kind of an altar where, where you can come and you can pray. And, 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 and I will be over here if you'd like to pray with me. And Pastor Ken will be over there if you'd like to pray with him. And we're going to have some other prayer partners down front who, who would be happy to talk with you and pray with you. If you want to just come and pray by yourself, that's fine too. If you want to come with, a, with somebody else, that's okay, whether you're in the balcony or down here. But, but let's, let's take this opportunity to respond to this God who invites us to his sufficient grace. This is, this is so important. A number of us today are feeling the pain of these thorns. What an awesome time to say, Lord, I'm going to give this thing into your hands. So I'm going to invite everybody to stand. Let's all stand together. <clears throat> and as we sing, I just want to invite you to come, just to come down here again. You can pray by yourself. You can pray with one of us. But let's, let's take advantage of these moments as we sing and worship and say, God, please remake me. I'm in a situation that does not feel like progress today in my family, in my marriage, at my work, in my body, in my heart. I'm praying for the sufficiency of your grace. So why don't you come? You come and pray as we sing. Please come.